G'day guys and gal. With the Imperial Fist being one of the most loved, most prestigious and most memeable Space Marine chapters, you would have thought I would have made a video on them by now. And maybe I should have, but it didn't feel right. I felt like it wasn't the right time, and boy I was right, as this is the first video where we have a real life Primarch. Introducing Rogel Dawn. Greetings Imperial Citizens, I am Rogel Dawn. Rogel graciously accepted my offer to have him on the channel. Your topic today is my sons, the Imperial Fists. It would be best to supervise you for factual accuracy. Well, you know me, never gotten any law wrong, ever. Rogel will be providing various insights today on the law of himself and his legion as we take a peek into the origins and law of the Imperial Fists, as well as everyone's favorite humorless Primarch. Humor is not necessary for a son of the Emperor, Major. However, I do not lack for humor. I cite my biggest joke of all, Sigismund. Oofed. Brutal. Let's get into it. The Milky Way galaxy had been through a lot. Galactic genocidal wars between gods, robotic uprisings, and the Elder being a bit too frisky and accidentally spawning Slash into existence were just some examples of this. Needless to say, humanity was in need of a win. And a win they would get, as a humble scientist simply called the God Emperor of Mankind, decided the galaxy was one big pair of cheeks in need of a final clap. To do this, he created 20 demigod babies called Primarchs, who would assist them in this cheek clapping crusade. There was no clapping of cheeks involved in the Great Crusade, but I have heard rumor as of late that my brother Robuti Gilliman has done similar things with the Eldari Emissary of Rain. In the galaxy, there was also four gods of chaos, who were not a fan of the Emperor's plan to bring order to the galaxy, hence they exploited the Primarch's mother's postnatal depression and used her to yeet the baby Primarchs across the galaxy. My mother was a tube. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that some other time, Rogel. Some Primarchs landed on nice planets and became privileged white kids. Gilliman. Whilst other Primarchs landed on religious worlds and got touched inappropriately by their adoptive parents. Mm, Lorgar. Our boy Dawn landed on the dying ice world of Inwit. Inwit sucked. It no longer rotated, hence one side of the planet was covered in perpetual darkness, whilst the other side had a constant dim daylight. The native creatures that were still alive were all quite unpleasant. Now on planets with similar situations to this, such as Nostromo, Conrad's planet, there was total breakdown of functional society and everyone became criminals. But not the hardy people of Inwit, no. The planet lacked natural resources, but the people made up for it with their unbreakable will. Despite having a legendary difficulty start planet, these people were able to build a star-spanning empire, colonizing numerous nearby worlds whilst leaving Inwit, their capital world, a horrible place to live, to ensure they never grew soft or forgot where they started. Rogel was a man of extreme practicality. He was adopted by House Dawn and quickly grew to fame and power. As Inuit was already an interstellar empire, people weren't like, oh wow, he's a god, let's praise him. They were more like, hey, that's pretty cool. Religion and superstition are the enemy of progress and peace, as father says. So notions of my divinity were discouraged. I was, however, extremely impressive. With practicality comes low controversy, hence Dawn had one of the most boring upbringings. Eventually Rogel's adoptive grandfather passed away and control of House Dawn fell to our boy. With his intelligence and suitability for leading, Rogel then quickly ascended to become the Emperor of the Inuit Empire. Not really an impressive name of an empire, is it? The empire was named after its planet of origin. It was a perfectly suitable name. Orbiting Inuit was an ancient massive space station from the Dark Age of Technology. Dawn made it his side project over the next 40 years to restore this derelict station back to functionality. It was called the Phalanx. Whilst this was all happening, the Emperor still needed assistant cheek clappers, and to use the DNA information he had from the Primarchs to create 20 legions of super soldiers called Astartes, or Space Marines. The seventh legion of Space Marines, the Sons of Dawn, were active and well documented for an early time. Like their gene father, the Seventh Legion was incredibly hardy and tough. The initiation process been remarked as especially painful, even by Space Marine standards. The Seventh Legion tore across Terra during the Unification Wars, not only conquering their enemies, but erecting mighty fortresses in their wake, hence beginning a legendary meme. Fortified bastions and ramparts are not a silly meme. They are essential and effective in consolidating conquered territory. Whatever you say, Rogel. 
The Seventh Legion gained their name through their ability to penetrate deep into the enemy, making them vulnerable. Cease! The Imperial Fists do not fist anyone. Perturabo's joke is lame and irrelevant. A fist is a versatile tool, but the act of fisting is one of the rarest actions a fist will perform. If you continue this vile talk, I will demonstrate a number of essential fist functions on your head. Eh. Eh. Okay. Eventually, the Emperor did arrive at the Inuit Empire, and Rogal, being a practical man, did not require the usual dick measuring contest required by a Primarch before they pledged themselves to their father. Contests of phallus measurement did not take place between father and I. You are literally a brick wall, aren't you? No. I am literally a Primarch. A brick wall is a far weaker structure compared to me. Jesus Christ. The Emperor had the phalanx renovated and returned to Rogal as a legendary fortress monastery. With Rogal already having great knowledge of how command worked, as well as futuristic technology, he was able to assume command of his legion extremely quickly. Some legions went through some pretty dramatic transformations when they met their Primarch. The Blood Angels went from berserkers to men of nobility who only sometimes became berserkers. The Imperial Fist did not change at all. Rogal liked building stuff, as did they, that's all they really needed for a seamless transition. Rogal also showed that he wasn't some obnoxious egomaniac douchebag by being one of the only Primarchs to not change his legion's name upon reuniting with them. Renaming a legion is tedious and unnecessary. The name Imperial Fists is... fitting. Underneath Rogal's cold, calm demeanor, it would be easy to assume that he had no heart, that he was an automaton with no will beyond serving the Emperor, that his soul was like a lobotomized Asperger's kid. But no, beneath that unchanging wall of truth, there was an extremely fierce spirit. A man who did what needed to be done not because he was told to, but because he looked forward to a galaxy at peace with the utmost joy and excitement. Beneath that golden Aurora Might power armor was a little boy who calmed down the days where the sun would set on a reality where he could build not to consolidate territory or to hold off invaders, but to house and provide comfort for the future generations of mankind. Comparing me to a little boy is insulting and incorrect. But it is true that the prospect of everlasting peace brought me great joy. There were many things I wanted to build that did not involve the deaths of billions. Because of this, Rogal shed his ego and any personal desires for the majority of the Great Crusade. He allowed himself to be the tool his father forged him to be. Any planet that the Imperial Fist saved, conquered, or made compliant for the Imperium was not exploited to further Rogal's own personal agenda or self-esteem. No, the only thing the Imperial Fist took from these worlds was more recruits to grow the strength and impact of the Seventh Legion. Between this duty-driven persona, as well as not measuring dicks with any of the other Primarchs, I do not know why you insist on using that comparison. Rogal became really popular within the Imperium and Primarchs themselves. To be clear, no one really liked him that much as a person, due to him having the personality of a baked fish. Baked fish cannot have a personality. They are dead. But the way he carried himself and his unwavering dedication to duty and the truth meant that everyone respected him. This did not go unnoticed by Daddy E either. The Imperial Fist had one of the better records during the Great Crusade, since the Emperor recalled Dawn and his sons to Terra in order to fortify the entire world and build the Imperial Palace naming them the Praetorians of Terra. Upon receiving this honor, Rogel was like, LMAO, LICK MY BALLS, PURDY! No. What did you say then when the Emperor himself named you his Praetorian? I said the Imperial Palace would be impregnable and untakeable, even by the likes of my traitor brother, Perturabo. To this day, that proclamation holds, and the Imperial Palace remains untaken. There's been a few close calls though, hasn't there, Rogel? Close does not count. My statement remains. Obviously, Perthi wasn't super stoked about this. Rogel was given all this honor, praise, and the task of building Terra, whilst Perthi, a man who wanted to create, was continually ordered to destroy. He fell into a rage-induced rant that was so insane that even his own sons were like, WTF, bro. The Great Crusade climaxed during the All-in-All -all Crusade. Please, stop, stop speaking deeply into the microphone. It makes me okay, uncomfortable. Okay, fine. I'll stop going deep. My discomfort merely grows. Oh, Rogel. The All in All Crusade was a great example of Games Workshop's complete inability to scale numbers correctly. 
The Orcs of Ulanor had the greatest Orc army the Imperium had ever witnessed, and it only took 100,000 Space Marines and 8 million Guardsmen to beat them. In comparison, World War II had over 250 million soldiers taking a part in it. That's right, a conflict on one planet years ago was 10 times bigger than an intergalactic race war that was considered the pinnacle of a galaxy-wide super war. Nice going, Games Workshop. Who is this Games Workshop you speak of? Probably we best don't get into that today, Rogel. For your sake. I wish to know. Uh, remember that time when Conrad nearly killed you in a fair fight? That was not a fight. That was an unprovoked and unforeseeable assault in which I was unarmored and unarmed. Unprovoked. Sure thing, Rogel. The Orcs of Ulanor were crushed, and the Biggie decided that he needed to get back to Terra to build the human webway, his solution to chaos. In his stead, he elected Horus as War Master to crush the remaining threats in the galaxy, and to bring it under total human domination. This started off well, with Horus being extremely grateful for the opportunity. He even sought advice from Rogel and Gulliman on how to best fulfill this role. As we know, that wise streak didn't last long, as Horus unleashed his inner boldness, induced insecurity, and embraced the forces of hell into his soul. Through the brave efforts of some loyalist Death Guard and Lunar Wolves, Rogel was one of the first to discover his brother's treachery, and he immediately sprang into action, deploying Alexis, Pollux, and Sigismund on separate campaigns to hold back the traders and secure key supplies and locations for the upcoming Siege of Terra. Despite being one legion, they fought like they were three. Sigismund secured key Martian supplies against overwhelming odds, Alexis Pollux devastated the Iron Warrior's fleet and nearly killed Perturabo, and Rogel fought off the Alpha Legion and brutally killed Alpharius in some hectic Mortal Kombat style fatality. My brother's death was quick and clean. I made no show of it. Despite his twisted heart and mind, he was still my brother. You tanked a killing blow from him, grabbed his spear, cut off his hands, cut open his chest with a chainsword, impaled him with his own spear, then you minced his brain with the aforementioned chainsword. Yes, a clean death. With the arrival of the Blood Angels and the White Scars, two legions not known at all for defense, the Loyalist forces had three legions, the Custodes, the Sisters of Silence, lots of Imperial soldiers, and some Titans, whilst the Traitors had eight legions, the majority of the Mechanicus, lots of demons, countless beastmen, guardsmen, countless Titans, and more. The point I'm trying to make here is that Rogel was disgustingly outnumbered, yet despite this, the palace held. Day after day of non-stop battle and death, the unbreakable wall of the fists held the line against everything Chaos had to throw at them. While Sanguinius was a beast, he wouldn't have had the opportunities to inflict the damage he did if the palace was just getting overwhelmed from every angle. Finally, Horus realized that Dawn had done it. The Ultramarines, Dark Angels, and Space Wolves were soon to arrive at Terra, which would spell instant doom for the Trader Legions, hence Horus successfully baited the Emperor, Sanguinius, Rogel, and friends onto his flagship. He killed Sanguinius, made the Emperor quadriplegic, then was slain by said quadriplegic, with Rogel discovering the broken body of his father and returning him to the Golden Throne, where he's remained ever since. For all my efforts fortifying Terra and the Imperium at large, I could not fortify my father's body against Horus. How do you fortify someone's body? That's, never mind. With the death of the Emperor, Dawn felt really bad, and for once completely abandoned any sense of fortification and defense, instead leading a devastating rage-fueled genocide of the Traitor Legions. He did his best to ignore Gulliman's new space book called the Codex Astartes, which ordered him to break up his legion into chapters to ensure no one would ever wield the power of a legion ever again. However, Dawn wasn't keen on this at all. His legion had held back the tides of chaos as a united force, and he did not want to see it divided. It nearly took another civil war before Rogel finally relented and allowed his legion to be divided. But before he did this, he had unfinished business with Perturabo. See, Dawn was all about pain and discipline, and he believed that before his legion could divide, they needed one final test. And this brings us to Dawn's greatest folly, the Iron no. Cage. Uh, wait, what? We will not speak of that occasion. Dawn, it, it's okay man, we don't hold it against you. History is important, you say so yourself. Yes, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Yes, so that means your unfortunate fight against Perti is a very important part of the Imperial Fist history yes. and your personal development as a character. So, if you continue now to I'm speak to talk of this, about I will ensure cage. that no fortification will protect you. Uh, 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 Dawn, do you know how I have the dog in that doghouse outside? Yes, 
Well, there, there's these possums that keep trying to get into it and mess it up. I will fortify this doghouse against the marsupial menace, but let it be known. I know you are only tempting me with this task so that you can speak of my greatest shame without fear of violent repercussion. I will return. Okay, so the Iron Cage. Basically, Purdy and his Iron Warriors fortified a world and issued a challenge to the Imperial Fists. Purdy believed him to be the greatest siege expert and more worthy of the Emperor's love than Dawn. Dawn, still blaming herself for the Emperor becoming a massive strain on the Imperium's healthcare system, accepted the challenge in a zealous rage, despite knowing it would likely cost him the lives of many of his sons. He declared he would bring Purdy back to Terra in an iron cage. Yeah, that, that didn't happen. The Imperial Fists rushed in and were bested in every way. Their fleet was scattered, their forces were bogged down and slaughtered, battle brothers using each other's corpses as cover, it was only their unbreakable will and Rogel's personal interventions that kept them from total annihilation. Once they ran out of ammo, they fought trench to trench using only combat knives. All of Rogel's commanders begged him to order a retreat, but he refused time and time again. On the brink of total destruction, Gulliman and his Ultramarines arrived to save the day, and even then Rogel was like- Gulliman, do not interfere with this lesson my sons and I learned. Oh, oh god, oh, you're back. How did you sneak up like that? You were so loud on your way out. I am a Primarch. I can be very sneaky when required. I have fortified the doghouse and slain many of the invading creatures. Y you weren't supposed to kill the possums, Rogel. They're native animals. It's really illegal. While slaying the beasts, I considered what you said. And you were right. My grief and rage towards my own failure to protect father nearly destroyed the legacy the Fists had built for centuries. Although I protested Gilliman's intervention at the time, I am grateful for it now. Wow, that's uh, that's really big of you, Rogel. I'm proud. I feel like we're really making a breakthrough here. With the combined might of the Ultramarines and the Imperial Fists, Perch Rabo was forced to retreat. However, he got what he wanted. Bragging rights. Whilst Rogel and his surviving sons gained a valuable lesson. A lesson that stuck with them even as they divided into the Imperial Fists led by Rogel, the Black Templars led by Sigismund, and the Crimson Fists led by Alexis Pollux. It would not be long after this that Abaddon, the Beta Cuck, failure of 13 Black Crusades, and the man who lost the melee fight to Eldrad, a 10,000 year old mage with crystal clunky bones, would emerge and launch his first Black Crusade. Rogel would rally to the Imperium's defense and fight hard against this chaotic menace, eventually finding himself stuck on one of their ships, where he tragically died. But he survived! Clearly, as we can see, despite all canon records pointing towards you still being dead. Cannons did not enter into my disappearance. Do not believe everything you read. With the vanishing of Rogel, death of Sigismund at the hand of Abaddon, and then the death of Alexis the Samzinos, not that Alexis was really that exciting or notable, the Imperial Fists haven't exactly been front and center in recent times. Sure, there was the War of the Beast, which, while weird, is actually canon and nearly resulted in the complete extermination of the Imperial Fists, like they needed to gain access to their last reserves of gene seed to make a comeback. And then there was the Age of Apostasy. The Imperial Fists were one of the Space Marine forces that assaulted George Van Dyer, who was very corrupt and problematic for the Imperium, as you can tell by his extremely evil sounding name. After that, they fought anyone and everyone, as did all the other Space Marine chapters. The Fists did not stray far from Terra though, allowing their weaponized autism, the Black Templars, to do the crusading for them. It wouldn't be until Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade that our boys truly rejoined the fray. As Abaddon sieged Cadia, the Phalanx, still in commission despite all the shiz that had happened, rushed to its defense. Apparently 10,000 years isn't enough time to get over things and move on, as the Iron Warriors then counterattacked the Phalanx and boarded it, nearly capturing it until the Legion of the Dam rocked up and kicked ass like they always do in times when great levels of cheese is needed. The Phalanx destroyed Abaddon's Blackstone Fortress, however its corpse was used as a makeshift meteor on the planet Cadia, destroying it. All the Phalanx could do at this point was to withdraw some survivors, whilst various other Imperial Fists joined the Crusade to Ultramar, where they bear witness to the resurrection of Gulliman. My brother has returned? Where did you hear of this? For the sake of all of our brains, Rogel, just ignore everything I have said or will say past me talking about your alleged death. With the coming of the Indomitus Crusade, as well as the Primaras, you bet your ass that our boys in yellow were some of the first to receive these taller reinforcements. It's actually about time that a new story was shined upon the Imperial Fists. These days, it seems like the Black Templars are the new poster boys of Dawn, whilst the OG Fists just fly around in the Phalanx, fortifying everything. 
And that does us for today, guys. The lore and story of the Imperial Fists. Obviously, there's hours upon hours of lore for these guys, especially since they're such a popular founding chapter, but you know how I like to do it. Hard and fast, baby. Massive cheers for Rogel Dawn for coming on and not murdering me during this video. The video is not yet over. Just, just make it quick, man. If you enjoyed this video, like boobs, and also get confused about what day of the year it is, then the Major Kill Hentai calendar is for you. 12 artworks drawn by 12 artists. This legendary calendar is only available for another couple of days until it's gone forever, so get yours. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more fortified content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.